Hello, Neil Singer again for CJP Safety and Education Foundation. And uh, ending week five here in quarantine lockdown, we're going to continue our discussion of landing performance. Today, we're going to talk about non dry runways. Uh, this is where we start exiting the realm of science and start getting into some pretty gray areas, as you'll see. Uh, the vast majority of runway overruns as a proportion of uh, time encountering runway conditions occur on non-dry runways. So it's especially important, especially high risk. So let's jump into it. So runway contamination. We're going to talk about both contamination and wet runways. Why is this such a, a important topic? Well, let's discuss the increase in likelihood of a runway overrun when we're talking about a non-dry runway. Is it 200%, 500%, 1300%, billion percent The answer is 1300%. Uh, we are 13 times more likely to see a runway overrun occur on a non-dry runway. So let's get into some quick definitions on what runway conditions mean. Uh, some of you have likely heard this definition that a wet runway is when there's enough moisture that the surface appears reflective with outstanding water. This is a widely distributed definition. Unfortunately, it's not correct from the FAA's point of view. The FAA is clear that a runway does not need to be reflective. If it's not dry, it's wet. If the runway is not completely dry, then we are to consider the runway wet. So that's what the definition of a wet runway is. We also use the term contaminated runway. Contaminated runway is when there is more than a quarter of an inch of, I'm sorry, more than an eighth of an inch of water, slush, or snow, or a mix of precipitation on more than one quarter of the runway surface. An eighth of an inch is approximately three millimeters. This is a very small amount of contamination. So if more than 25% of the surface has more than three millimeters depth of any precipitation, then the runway is considered contaminated. Uh, Boeing did a review of 29 uh, transport category runway overruns uh, across about a decade. And what they found was 23 of these 29 were on non-dry runways. Of those 23, 12 were wet only, not contaminated. So a uh, condition of a wet only runway without that extra depth that makes it contaminated still has led to over half of the uh, non-dry uh, incidents in this particular survey. Uh, with these wet only runways, 75% of them experienced medium or poor braking action. Okay, so again, a lot of pilots have become inured to this idea that when landing on a properly surfaced grooved uh, or PFC overlay runway, that a wet only condition does not represent a particular hazard, yet the data shows we can experience fairly significant decrease in braking action, even just in the presence of rain less than three millimeters, water less than three millimeters. Uh, on a note that is somewhat positive because it puts some of the control back in the pilot's hands, all but one of these 23 events in this one survey had one or more compounding factors that were within the pilot's control. Okay, so we might have had a tailwind landing with a tailwind on a non-dry surface. We may have had improper uh, speed brake and reverser deployments. This is not something in our citations we spend as much time worrying about, yet for our Mustangs we still do have to manually deploy speed brakes. For our 525 series we have to manually deploy uh, ground flaps which will also deploy speed brakes, um, or in the case of the CJ4 um, uh, there's a, a little different procedure. But case being, in these situations we saw a improper use of these stopping aids. And then finally, uh, in nine of the 23, there was an unstabilized approach. And we talked briefly in the last video about some stabilized approach criteria we will revisit in a future uh, video in more depth. So those add up to more than 23 because uh, some of the events had more than one of those present. So even though we cannot control the condition of the runway, those variables are within the pilot's control. 
So there are some lessons we can take away from looking at the accident history of landings on non-dry runways. And one is that if a non-dry runway, the physical length is close to what we have calculated as a required length, there is very little or no margin for error. We need to be extra vigilant for meeting stabilized approach criteria. We need to be spring loaded to be thinking about a go around in these situations if we are not completely stabilized. And we need to use all of the stopping aids available to us until that taxi speed. Uh, again, those events where the pilots did not use all of the stopping aids available, often an aircraft will touch down, pilot will experience what they perceive as good braking. Um, they will not use full braking on a wet runway. When we enter the last 3,000 feet of our runway, we are entering the touchdown zone for the opposite end. So that is where we're likely to see rubber deposits uh, that will increase the chance of hydroplaning. So there have been a lot of uh, accidents historically where pilots used moderate braking, entered the touchdown zone at the end of the runway, experienced a degradation of braking, tried to increase their stopping and were not able to and ended up going off the end of the runway. If they had used full stopping forces as soon as they touched down, the NTSB calculated they would have been able to stop on the runway, but waiting till that last 3,000 feet um, precluded that. So what is required runway on a non-dry surface? How do we know how much runway we should think of as the required runway? Well, unfortunately, this is not a scientific process. This starts to get into statistics and probability here. Uh, the OEM, when they certify the aircraft, is not required to certify non-dry landing performance information. So as a result, it is allowed to be, and usually is, a computation based off of dry information. It is not measured data. There is no requirement that a test pilot goes out and lands on a wet runway and says, yes, this is how much runway was required to stop the airplane at this weight, at this altitude, at this temperature. Uh, so it's typically done based on a mathematical computation. And uh, Textron Cessna tells us this. This is an excerpt from a AFM for one of our 525s. And it tells us for wet runways, this is advisory information. It is not FAA approved. These are to be considered the minimums. These may well be uh, not realistic. We may well require more runway than this shown. Okay, so our previous conversation about safety margins becomes even more important when we're talking about wet runways because again, the number we look up in our manuals has been told to us to be a absolute minimum possible theoretical requirement. So when we look, again, in the case of uh, one of our, I believe this is an M2, but uh, the tables look the same. When we look in our corrections for wet runway, what we see is we look at our dry runway distance that we've computed. And then we apply a correction factor. Uh, so if we needed 2,600 feet on a dry runway, if we're flying right at VREF, then Cessna says our minimum to land on a wet runway would be 3,600 feet of runway. Uh, what we find is if we go down this table, we're getting roughly 40 to 50% increase over our dry runway distance. Another way to think about that is about a 60% increase in our dry stopping distance because of course the first thousand feet of touchdown is air distance, approximately a thousand feet. We've uh, seen before that that could actually be closer to 900 feet during certification. But that's of course not gonna be changed by the runway surface. Whatever the braking is, that air distance will be unchanged. It's the point from the main wheels touching down and the braking beginning that is the uh, part that will be affected. Well, so a 60% increase in stopping distance, is that realistic? Is that sufficient? Uh, the answer is not always. So the FAA themselves uh, has released a lot of advisory circulars and information on expected landing performance on non-dry surfaces. And what they tell us is when we land, a aircraft on a well-maintained grooved wet runway, we may experience as little as a 15% increase in dry stopping distance. So falling in that range that most OEMs uh, uh, bump up. However, when we start getting into suboptimal conditions, so here we have a situation where we have poor maintenance of grooves. The grooves have started to degrade over time. They're not in as good condition. They're not as able to channel water off the runway as they were. 
or maybe we have heavy rubber deposits, which can increase the chances of hydroplaning. The FAA says in this case, we can require 90% more dry stopping distance. What about an ungroved runway? Rough uh, number from the FAA is a 2x increase in dry stopping distance. And what if we compound some of these factors, an ungroved uh, runway with rubber deposits or a brand new surface where there's uh, still a very slick surface texture, then the FAA says in some cases we could experience up to a 4x increase in dry stopping distance. So we have one number, okay? When we look at our AFM and we look at our advisory information for our wet runway number, we don't have different wet runway numbers for grooved or ungrooved runways for a good condition or a bad condition, right? We're just given one number. So this is where I say we start operating in a gray area. Um, we see through some studies that NASA has done that small variables uh, can have a big effect on the actual stopping. So we're gonna look at some charts that look like this chart here. So let's just take a second and explain it. Across the x-axis, the horizontal axis, we have uh, the ground speed in knots. So we're starting uh, from the right at about 90 knots ground speed, and then imagine the aircraft is decelerating, moving to the left of this chart. Its ground speed is decreasing. Um, the vertical axis is the percentage of friction as measured relative to a dry runway. So NASA did some studies. These were two particular airports in the Northeast, uh, Portland, uh, and then Pease Air Force Base in New Hampshire. Uh, both these were 727s. And what they found was uh, the same type of surface. When it was new, um, this surface was able to provide, when wet, uh, approximately 90 or better percent of the friction that a dry runway would have experienced. So very close to dry runway stopping performance. But after that same type of surface, had worn over the course of 11 years and the texture was no longer as optimal for uh, allowing friction uh, between the surface and the tire. That, that braking decreased from 90 plus percent to 70 to 80 percent, okay? We have no way, of course, of practically knowing this. When we land at an airport, it's really not feasible that we're gonna find out how old is this surface? What is the condition of this surface? So as I say, we start operating in a gray area. We're, we look up one number and we might have the sense that this is a definitive number that represents an absolute when really uh, that number is supposed to take into account variables that it just can't. Further, we, see that grooving has a large effect on runways. So in this case, NASA did some landings with 737. Uh, the blue line is on a wet, ungrooved runway. So as we see at high speed on a ungrooved runway, when the runway was wet, the airplane starts experiencing uh, breaking about a third as effective friction as if the runway was dry. As the plane slows down, the braking becomes more effective uh, reaching a peak of about 75%. We see that the grooved runway is, is quite good. It's quite helpful, but it's not the same as a dry runway. Okay, so on one grooved runway, the airplane uh, with this level of moisture experienced a fairly consistent 80% friction relative to a dry runway. But that was for a runway with one and a half inch spacing on the grooves. Most airports, uh, the FAA calls for, uh, if a runway is gonna be grooved, spacing the grooves at one and a half inches. Most airports are spaced that way. Uh, however, it's less expensive to groove a runway with uh, grooves farther apart. So some airports don't follow the optimal 1.5 inch spacing. And what uh, NASA found was if the grooves are spaced twice as far apart, you can see anywhere from a five to 15% reduction in the uh, braking effectiveness. Again, this is information we have no access to. We can look in our chart supplement. Uh, we can look on our JEP 109 charts to see if a runway is grooved or not. But I am not aware of any information that is easily available to the pilot that would say if it's grooved in compliance with recommended standards or not. So again, in a gray area here. Um, we talked at our first video about the SAFOs that have been released uh, regarding wet or uh, contaminated uh, runway turbojet braking overruns, um, uh, landing overruns, excuse me. Um, the most recent version of this came out towards the end of last year, July of 2019. 
and it was updated. And this is a, a really important SAFO, and this gives us some very practical takeaways that we can use. Um, I'm gonna leave the material up on the screen, I'm not gonna read the, the whole content. I would strongly encourage everyone who flies a jet aircraft to download this SAFO uh, available online and spend some time reading it and try to understand it. But we're gonna highlight the bullet points here. Uh, again, this came out of a realization that braking coefficients for uh, several runway overruns on non-dry runways was less than expected by the FAA. These occurred on both grooved and ungrooved runways, and the data indicated that the default 15% safety margin that the FAA requires for Part 135-121 operators uh, may not be enough, may be inadequate. As a result, um, what they found is that 30 to 40% of additional stopping can be required when the runway transitions from wet to contaminated conditions. Remember, again, that's predicated on three millimeters, one eighth of an inch of uh, contamination. They point out and emphasize that determining if the runway is wet or contaminated is the pilot's responsibility. They recommend that an airport report wet conditions, but it's not required. Uh, and further, the airport may not be able to gener generate a field condition report for a sudden uh, increase in rain rate that results in the transition from wet to contamination. That the present uh, rainfall intensity may be the only indication available to the pilot as to what the water depth is and when to expect that we have transitioned from a wet to a contaminated condition. Uh, they further note that this one eighth inch threshold separating wet from con contaminated results in a runway condition code uh, transitioning from five to two um, and seeing a drastically increased chance of hydroplaning. This is especially, especially true, they emphasize, on moderate rain on a non grooved or PFC overlay uh, runway, or if even those are present when the water overwhelms the ability of the runway to uh, channel that water off the runway. So there are some takeaways in this SAFO that are, are nice action points for us. The recommendation is if we are landing on a smooth, meaning a non-grooved runway, and again, that information is available in our chart supplement and our JET 10-9 charts. So on a non-grooved runway, if we are landing in moderate or heavy rain, or if we are landing on a grooved runway with heavy rain, then the recommendation is we no longer use our wet runway performance numbers and we transition to our contaminated runway performance numbers. So this gives us a nice simple flow chart to use. We can look at our runway conditions in terms of is the runway grooved or not, we can look at the rate of precipitation. If we see light, moderate, or heavy rainfall, and then again, based on these recommendations, we can determine whether we should use our wet or our contaminated runway charts. Some emphasis points, uh, special weather observation does not have to be generated when rainfall rates change. So you could have a, a METAR, you could have an ATIS that is reporting light rain. If only the uh, intensity of rainfall has changed, you may not have a new one. So it's important to be observing what you're seeing at the time of landing. And the FAA is recommending that then thinking ahead and saying, okay, if I'm doing a landing and right now light rain is reported. However, if this rainfall increases to moderate or heavy, I know I'm landing on a non-grooved smooth surface. I need to know ahead of time if the rainfall increases I now should be using contaminated runways. Will I still be able to land on that runway? Okay, in the case of a long runway, I might be. I might be fine with wet or contaminated, but that's important information to determine ahead of time. We've been talking about these runway condition codes. Just to review uh, real quickly, this has been out for a few years now, uh, starting with a runway condition code of six, decreasing down to zero, corresponding to breaking action nil. Uh, these are roughly correlated to an expected pilot report breaking action, correlated to a uh, type of precipitation, and then also to what the pilot would observe in braking control, and, I'm sorry, braking uh, action and uh, directional control on the runway. 
So one of the tools the Safety and Education Foundation has created are the in-flight guides available for most of the major models our members fly. And in this particular case for the M2, one of the useful charts in all of these in-flight guides is a excerpt from the AFM that shows the correction for a contaminated landing. And we've done a little correlation across the bottom with those runway condition codes. So we see for the example where we would expect a dry runway stopping uh, needing 2,400 feet total, we would see that in the case of a contaminated water covered runway with an eighth of an inch, we would need just a little over 4,500 feet, a significant increase. Uh, you may notice that for both water uh, and for slush or snow covered runways, as the uh, precipitation depth increases, the stopping distance actually decreases because as we start encountering deeper precipitation, it exerts a slowing force, uh, friction against the tires of the aircraft. So we certainly recommend uh, the safety committee that you use the most conservative numbers. So if based on the recommendations of that recent SAFO, you were landing on a runway and you then were guided to use contaminated water numbers, we recommend you use the most conservative, which would be the eighth inch.